The holy wars, the crusades, marked by faith and fervor, ambition and despair, spanned over 200 years. But why did they end in tragedy and failure for the crusaders? What secrets are buried in the ruins of castles and the pages of history? We dive deep into the untold stories, the shocking truths, and the complex tapestry of cultures and religions that clashed in the Holy Land. Was it sheer faith that drove men to march thousands of miles from their homes? Or was it the lure of wealth and land? How did cultural misunderstandings and strategic miscalculations shape the outcome of these epic battles? Who were the heroes and villains, both celebrated and unsung, who left their mark on this tumultuous period? Pope Urban II's call was deeply rooted in religious motivations. The Byzantine Empire, facing a growing threat from Seljuk Turks, who had made significant inroads into their territory, including the capture of Jerusalem, appealed to the West for help. Seizing this opportunity, Urban II framed the military expedition as a holy pilgrimage, promising spiritual rewards for those who took up the cross. The Pope's declaration at the Council of Clermont was not just a call to arms, but a summons to a spiritual journey, offering plenary indulgence, complete forgiveness of sins, to those who participated. The call to arms also came at a time when Europe was undergoing significant social and political changes. Feudal Europe was fragmented, with local lords wielding considerable power in their domains. The Pope's call presented an opportunity to unify these disparate forces under a common cause, potentially reducing internal conflict. Furthermore, the promise of wealth and land in the East offered a compelling incentive for younger sons of nobility, who stood to inherit little or nothing under the laws of primogeniture to participate in the Crusades. Pope Urban II was a shrewd politician and spiritual leader who recognized the potential to strengthen the papacy and expand Christendom's influence. By positioning the papacy as the leader of this holy mission, Urban aimed to assert the authority of the church over both spiritual and temporal matters. His charismatic speeches and letters emphasized the liberation of Jerusalem and the Holy Sepulchre, Christianity's most sacred sites as a divine mandate, framing the Crusades as a moral and religious duty for all Christians. The mobilization for the First Crusade was a remarkable feat, reflecting both the widespread appeal of Urban's message and the organizational capabilities of the time. Nobles and knights, motivated by faith, adventure, and the lure of riches, pledged their support, taking the cross by sewing crosses on their garments as a symbol of their commitment. This movement also attracted peasants and commoners, driven by religious devotion or the promise of social and economic gain leading to a diverse and vast assembly of people ready to march to the Holy Land. Before setting out, crusaders had to prepare extensively. This preparation involved not only gathering arms and armor, but also securing provisions for the long journey ahead. Many sold their lands or entered into debts to finance their expedition, motivated by spiritual promises and the lure of potential riches. The departure of the crusaders was often marked by religious ceremonies, where they would take vows and receive blessings, reinforcing the pilgrimage aspect of the crusade. The journey to the Holy Land could follow several routes, each with its own set of challenges. Overland through Europe and Asia Minor. This was the most direct route for many, especially those starting from Western and Central Europe. Crusaders would travel through the Byzantine Empire, crossing into Asia Minor, where they faced the dual challenges of hostile territories and difficult terrain. The overland journey was marked by battles with local forces, the need to negotiate safe passage, and the constant threat of ambushes. Sea voyages. Some crusaders, particularly those from maritime regions like southern France, Italy, and later on England, chose to travel by sea. This route required securing passage with ships, a daunting task given the era's limited naval capacity. Sea voyages offered the advantage of bypassing hostile territories, but came with their own dangers, including storms, piracy, and the logistical challenge of landing and supplying a large force in a foreign land. Regardless of the route chosen, crusaders faced immense hardships, disease, and famine. The journey was long, often taking months or even years, 
and the large numbers of people moving together meant that food and clean water were scarce. Disease was rampant, and many died from illnesses like dysentery, typhus, and cholera. Geographical obstacles, mountains, deserts, and rivers posed significant challenges, testing the endurance of the Crusaders and their mounts. The harsh climate, particularly in the deserts of the Middle East, took a heavy toll on European forces unaccustomed to such conditions. Attacks by local forces. The Crusaders' passage through foreign lands did not go uncontested. They faced resistance from Muslim forces in Asia Minor and the Levant, as well as from some Christian territories wary of their intentions. The Battle of Dorylaeum, 1097, during the First Crusade is a prime example of the military challenges faced en route to Jerusalem. The journey to the Holy Land had a profound impact on those who undertook it and on the regions they passed through. It led to cultural exchanges, albeit often through conflict, and exposed crusaders to new ideas, technologies, and customs. The hardships and experiences of the journey bonded the crusaders together, forging a sense of shared purpose and identity that transcended their diverse origins. Despite these obstacles, the First Crusade saw remarkable successes, culminating in the capture of Jerusalem in 1099. This initial victory, however, belied the difficulties to come, as maintaining control over the Holy Land and securing safe pilgrimage routes proved to be a complex and enduring struggle. One of the earliest significant setbacks for the Crusaders was the loss of the county of Edessa to Zengi in 1144. This event shocked the Christian world and led to the Second Crusade, which ended in failure with no significant gains and highlighted the Crusaders' vulnerability. This pattern of military defeat and loss of territory continued with the rise of Salah ad-Din Yusuf ibn Ayyub, known as Saladin, who recaptured Jerusalem in 1187 after the Battle of Hattin. The loss of Jerusalem was a devastating blow to Christendom and marked a turning point in the Crusades, leading to the Third Crusade, which failed to recapture Jerusalem despite several victories. The Third Crusade, 1189-1192, also known as the King's Crusade, is one of the most famous campaigns in the entire series of the Crusades, marked by the involvement of some of Europe's most powerful monarchs and by dramatic confrontations between Christian forces and the Muslim army led by Saladin. The Third Crusade was led by three of Europe's most powerful rulers, Emperor Frederick Barbarossa of the Holy Roman Empire, King Philip II, Augustus of France, and King Richard the Lionheart of England. Their involvement reflected the seriousness with which Christendom viewed the loss of Jerusalem. Frederick Barbarossa's campaign was cut short by his unexpected death in 1190 while crossing a river in Anatolia. His army, demoralized and diminished by hardships, largely disbanded, with only a fraction reaching the Holy Land. Philip II and Richard Lionheart arrived in the Holy Land by sea with their forces in 1191. Their combined armies achieved significant victories, including the capture of the strategic port city of Acre after a prolonged siege. These successes boosted Crusader morale and significantly weakened Muslim positions along the coast. One of the campaign's pivotal moments was the Battle of Arsuf in 1191, where Richard Lionheart's forces defeated Saladin's army. This victory was a testament to Richard's military prowess and ensured the Crusaders a strong foothold in the region. It allowed for the re-establishment of a fortified Crusader presence along the coast, from Jaffa to Tyre, securing vital supply lines and opening up the possibility of an advance on Jerusalem. Despite these military successes, the Crusaders faced significant challenges there was discord among the Crusader leaders, particularly between Richard and Philip. Philip returned to France after the Siege of Acre, citing illness and the need to address domestic issues, but tensions between him and Richard also played a part. This left Richard as the primary leader of the Crusade, but his forces were not strong enough to secure an outright victory. Richard and Saladin engaged in several rounds of negotiations for the peaceful surrender of Jerusalem, but these efforts were ultimately unsuccessful. The demands and counter-demands made by each side reflected not only the military stalemate, but also the deep religious significance of Jerusalem to both Islam and Christianity, making any compromise difficult. Richard led his army within sight of Jerusalem twice, but decided against laying siege to the city on both occasions. 
His reasons included the recognition of his army's logistical limitations, the risk of counterattacks by Saladin's forces, and the likelihood that even if Jerusalem were captured, the Crusaders would not be able to hold it for long. These decisions have been debated by historians, with some viewing them as pragmatic assessments of the situation and others as missed opportunities. The Third Crusade concluded with the Treaty of Jaffa in 1192. This treaty allowed Christians pilgrim access to Jerusalem and maintained Crusader control over a chain of coastal cities, but it left Jerusalem under Muslim control. The treaty was seen as a compromise that allowed both leaders to claim some measure of victory. Saladin retained control of Jerusalem, while Richard secured concessions that allowed for the safe passage of Christian pilgrims to the holy sites. The Fourth Crusade, 1202-1204, is often cited as a pivotal moment in the decline of the crusading movement. Instead of reaching the Holy Land, the Crusaders were diverted to Constantinople, which they sacked in 1204. This event not only weakened the Byzantine Empire, a crucial Christian ally, but also deepened the schism between the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches. The diversion of the Crusade highlighted the growing disconnection between the original religious goals of the Crusades and the political and economic motivations that came to dominate later campaigns. The Crusader states themselves were often plagued by internal divisions and rivalries, which undermined their strength and ability to present a united front against Muslim forces. The lack of strong, centralized leadership and the frequent disputes over succession and territory weakened the Crusader states from within. Maintaining long and secure supply lines from Europe to the Holy Land was a constant challenge for the Crusaders. The difficulty of transporting men, horses, and supplies across such vast distances, coupled with the need to secure local resources in a hostile environment, strained the Crusaders' resources and operational capabilities. The strengthening of Muslim resistance against the Crusaders was a pivotal factor in the eventual failure of the Crusades. This resistance was not spontaneous, but the result of strategic leadership, political consolidation, and military innovation over years. It was Saladin who achieved the most significant unification, bringing together Egypt and Syria under a single rule. This unification of Muslim lands was crucial for pooling resources, coordinating military efforts, and presenting a unified front against the Crusaders. Muslim leaders adopted and adapted military strategies and technologies that were effective against the Crusaders. They learned from early defeats and successes alike, improving their siege techniques and cavalry tactics. Saladin, in particular, is noted for his use of mobile light cavalry to harass and outmaneuver the heavier Crusader forces. Muslim leaders also excelled in diplomacy, forging alliances within the Islamic world, and at times, with Christian states against common enemies. This included alliances among different Muslim sects and regions, which had previously been at odds with one another. Nur ad-Din, for instance, played a significant role in promoting Sunni unity across his territories, while Saladin managed to extend this unity to include Shia Egypt. Control over trade routes and economic resources played a significant role in the strengthening of Muslim resistance. By securing key ports and trade routes, Muslim leaders could fund their military campaigns and undermine the economic base of the Crusader states. Saladin's control over Egypt, a wealthy center of trade and agriculture, provided him with the resources necessary to sustain prolonged military campaigns against the Crusaders. The defense of Islam and the recovery of Jerusalem were powerful unifying and motivating factors for the Muslim world. Leaders like Saladin were adept at framing the conflict in religious terms, invoking the concept of jihad to rally support across different regions and social classes. This religious and ideological mobilization helped in gathering troops, securing financial support, and legitimizing the leader's military campaigns. Understanding the importance of strong defensive positions, Muslim leaders invested in the fortification of cities and castles, making them formidable obstacles to Crusader advances. This included the construction of new fortifications and the strengthening of existing ones, which played a crucial role in the defense of key territories and in wearing down Crusader forces during sieges. 
After the fall of Jerusalem in 1187 to Saladin, the Crusader states never fully recovered. Despite brief periods of success and the recapture of some territories during the Third Crusade, the Crusaders were unable to secure Jerusalem again. The fall of Acre in 1291 to the Mamluks, under the leadership of Sultan al-Ashraf Khalil, was a devastating blow and is often cited as the symbolic end of the Crusades. Acre had become the capital of the Kingdom of Jerusalem and was the last major stronghold of the Crusader states in the Holy Land. Its loss marked the end of the Crusader presence in the region. By the late 13th and early 14th centuries, Europe's political and social landscape was changing. The rise of powerful nation-states and internal conflicts within Europe shifted focus away from the Holy Land. The Hundred Years' War between England and France, the Reconquista in Spain, and political instability within the Byzantine Empire redirected resources and attention from crusading efforts. Additionally, the rise of the Ottoman Empire in the late 13th century posed a new threat to European powers further diverting their focus from the Crusades to defending their own territories. While the Crusades failed to achieve their ultimate goal of securing the Holy Land for Christendom, they left a lasting impact on both the Middle East and Europe. They facilitated cultural and technological exchanges, influenced the development of European military tactics and castle architecture, and contributed to the growth of trade between the East and West. However, they also left a legacy of religious intolerance and set a precedent for religiously justified warfare that would have repercussions for centuries. The end of the Crusades marked the close of a significant chapter in medieval history, reflecting the complexities of religious fervor, political ambition, and the perennial struggle for power and resources. The Crusades' legacy is a mixed one, characterized by both the achievements of cross-cultural exchange and the tragedies of conflict and misunderstanding. If you've been captivated by the stories of valor, faith, and the relentless pursuit of ideals that have defined the Crusades, then don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel. Your support helps us bring more fascinating tales from history to light, exploring the depths of our shared past and the lessons it holds for the future.